What's up, everybody? It's Chris Stefano, aka Chris Tariq Stefano, and this is Chris Tariq. Today, we're going to be talking about one of my favorite subjects: a battle in World War II. We're talking Nazi Germany versus the French and the British, lightning warfare, and how the good guys, the good guys, jumped on some fishing boats to escape the crystal meth Nazis. We are going to be talking about the Battle of Dunkirk. You've seen the movie with Tom Hardy. Well, I'm the new Tom Hardy. Tom Softy. So let's set the scene here, okay? In Europe, in the 1930s, we have Germans. They are poor. They're pissed off. They got absolutely fucked over by the Treaty of Versailles in World War I where basically they got nothing and they had to, they got, they lost the war. Their whole country was blown to shit. Then they had to pay all this money back to the winners. And Germany was like, yeah, but we have no money. And our whole country's on fire. And so what happened was, is this gave rise for Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler, who was a, f a soldier in World War I over the next, you know, 20 years after 1918, starts to rally the German people and be like, wouldn't it be better if we just tried to take over the world again? Because they took all our money. And they are dirty, dirty people. And in 1933, Adolf Hitler became chancellor of Germany. Um, and basically, he put into power the Nazis. The Nazis came into power and he implemented a lot of the uh, policies that would make Germany become a you know totalitarian state that we knew it as it's really Hitler. World War I has a lot to do with World War II, just like AOC is gonna have a lot to do with World War III. No, I'm kidding. It's whoever you want it to be. World War III is upon us. I'm gonna blame it all on Zelensky. Hitler believed that if Germany expanded its territories and started just taking more countries that they would profit and get out of this economic rut that they were in. Because, you know, war is business, right? War is business. I just watched a documentary about the fifth plane involved in 9-11, and it's wild. There was a fifth plane, and I saw the documentary on Hulu, so I know it's true. As the German people expand, Hitler's idea was they should have a new racial order in Europe. Woo! Just Aryans, just white people, okay? Just biological white people. That's what he believed. He felt that during the expansion, there would be, you would have to eliminate certain groups he considered inferior, particularly the Jews. That's fucked up. And what he did was he kind of made this program of aggressive expansion and he annexed Austria, which is beautiful, by the way. Austria, the best, the best hot chocolate I've ever had in my life is in Austria. And also parts of Czechoslovakia, RIP, not a country anymore, before he invaded Poland in 1939. So that was the first big place that he invaded was Poland, which Poland always starts to get kicked around a little bit right before a world war starts. Shout out Lukasz, or the Polish doctor of the of the of Christeries, of Christery de Stefano. I'm gonna go kick around Lukasz a little bit this weekend in Florida. World War II starts on September 1st, 1939 with the German invasion of Poland. Germany came in with tanks and Poland met the tanks with horses. I swear to God. Poland was like, oh, I, sorry, we thought it was 1839, not 1939. Oh, that's a tank. My horse should be able to stand up to my tank, to, to that tank. And then it didn't. They killed a lot of horses. Unfortunately, the Germans killed a lot of horses, you fucking horse murderers. The only person that could have stopped the invasion into Poland was... Greta Thunberg, but she wasn't alive yet. Okay, let's take a look at this map because I want to make sure everybody knows where Germany is and where everybody knows the countries that they're invading. As you, if you, you noticed, all the blue, that blue wall of water, to the left of that, the United States. Germany wasn't going to be able to get into the United States because we are protected by Jesus Christ himself. Jesus Christ made a, a bathtub of water in between the dirty Nazis and us, the great American people who have done nothing from day one but help other countries and treat all races equal, equal, is what we do here in the United States. We are about equality. All right, so we got World War II, we got the two sides. We got the Axis powers, we got Germany led by Adolf Hitler, and then we got Italy led by Benito Mussolini, you little fucker. 
And then we have the allies, the good guys, United Kingdom, Prime Minister Winston Churchill, success is not final, failure is not fatal, it's the courage to continue that counts. France, led by President Albert Lebrun, Albert Lebrun James, and Prime Minister Paul Reynaud, and the Soviet Union, led by Premier Joseph Stol. Hello, hello, my name is Joseph Stalin, hello. Okay, so the Axis powers versus the Allied powers. The term Axis actually was coined by Germany. They like that. And it referred to the Axis alliance between Germany, Italy, and Japan. Um, and the Axis powers, they, you know, they were united in their opposition to fight the Allied powers. And they formed this alliance um, to achieve shared goals of expanding territories, resources, and influence. So that's why they, they did that. They all had this common... You know, and by the way, J Japan was also uh, a victim of the Treaty of Versailles in World War I. So Japan also was angry that they didn't get more after World War I because Japan was actually on the Allied side in World War I. And they were like, wait a minute, I was one of the winners and you still didn't give me anything. And I was like, yeah, well, you, you sit on the floor in your houses and you don't have furniture. And as us as the Allies think that's weird. Japanese people sit on the floor a lot on pillows. But that's good. I need to start doing that. It's good hip flexibility. And their toilets are just little holes off the floor. But that's why, but that's the proper way to, to take a shit is the way, the Japanese way to take a shit is the way to take a shit. They're the number one at that. So we're not even a year into the war and Germany launches what's known as the Blitzkrieg, which is basically, they just start invading every country. They're going a, a million miles a minute. They're all on crack. They're on pervitin. They're on crystal meth, which we're going to get to in a second. And they are just invading countries. They invaded Belgium, the Netherlands, France. Blitzkrieg was a German word. It means lightning war, lightning war. What the Blitzkrieg tactic was, was swift and overwhelming attack using a, a combination of ground forces, tanks, and air power to quickly defeat an enemy. And that's what they were doing. They were quickly defeating an enemy, okay? They came quick. It was like Jim Norton with a male prostitute. <laughs> Let's be honest, me too. So Germany in May 1940, May of 1940, the Battle of France happens. Germany kind of invades France. By the way, France was the number one army in the world. They were the one seed. Everybody thought they were the top dogs, but Germany is going to steamroll them pretty quick. So the Battle of France, it is May 10th to June 25th, 1984. A lovely time to be in France, but not you didn't want to be there in 1940. The German airborne uh, attack, known as the Luftwaffe, they quickly demolished the Dutch and Belgian forces. Well, we'll see what Russell Shorto has to say about that. Hopefully you saw that episode on... Uh, Chrissy Chaos, the great Dutch, uh, the great Dutch historian Russell Shorto, um, and they surrounded uh, Germany, surrounded um, uh, the Dutch and Belgian forces in France very quickly. So then you had British, French, and Belgian troops. Every time I see the word Belgian, I want to eat a waffle. That's just what it is. So if I was fighting with the Belgian troops, I would just be like, guys, you guys, you, you make me too hungry. But the British, French, and Belgian troops, they. Um, they reinforced the position against the advancing German army into Belgium, but they weren't able to hold it. They, the Belgians just couldn't hold it because it's just Belgians, they're not fighters. They have chocolate, they have beer, they have waffles, they have Dr. Evil, they're not fighters. And France was falling rapidly. I mean, France was just, they were getting the shit kicked out of them because even though they were a great army, all they wanted to do is eat wine, drink cheese, and have sex with prostitutes. That's all they wanted. And the main German force, they had moved, uh, they had moved um, into the River Meuse, it's called, and they had started advancing west towards the English Channel. So they are just about to take over all of France, um, and the French knows it. They, they know it. During a visit to Paris on May 17th, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, fat fuck with a cigar in his mouth, was astonished, astonished to learn that the French commander-in-chief had absolutely no strategic reserves for such an emergency. It's like, what did you think? What are you doing, France? By the way, the Blitzkrieg, that Germany invented that. There was no strategy like this before. They used to fight, you know, like they would dig trenches. They would go all in, you know, form order. But the Blitzkrieg was just like all out war. I'm just coming at you. I'm coming at you from all different angles. I am in your face. You know, just coming all over your face like Matt Reif. Listen, you have to understand, no country in the world was really ready for such an attack by the Germans. Y'all ain't ready. That's what they were saying as they were charging into Poland. They were going, y'all ain't ready. And then just cracked out. Do you have to understand how much crystal meth every single soldier and person in Germany was on? But things were pretty quiet leading up to the invasion um, 
As a matter of fact, the original conflict, it was called the, the phony war because not, not, not a lot of things were going on. Nobody really, nobody saw anything coming. It was almost like the calm before the storm, you know? And there wasn't a lot of military action at all on the Western Front. Um, both sides um, had this strategy where they were just kind of preparing for the decisive battle, but nothing was actually happening. There's actually a great Netflix movie called All Quiet on the Western Front. It's about some of this lead up time into the war. All Quiet on the Western Front is a very interesting movie, by the way, because it's one of the only movies I've seen that does the Nazi German point of view, not the Allied point of view. They, they take it from, because a lot of these German soldiers who fought in the war, not all of them were, I mean, yes, they were all you know fighting under the Nazi flag, but not all of them believed in Hitler. And a lot of them were like, I don't want to kill Jews. I don't want to do any of that. I'm, you're making me fight in a war. You're telling me if I don't go fight for Germany, even though I don't want to, that you're going to kill my family and you know burn down my farm. So I guess I have to fight. Now we're May 20th, the Germans, they had basically pushed the Allied troops back, 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 back to the English Channel, and they began to close onto the town of Dunkirk, where you've seen this movie with Tom Hardy. Dunkirk, he won, I think he won an award for it. I, I didn't understand one word Tom Hardy said in the entire movie at all, but I just loved his performance in it. But I genuinely don't know one thing he fucking said because he did half the movie with the mask on because he's in the plane the whole time. Let's set the scene for Dunkirk. Who's there? About 338,000 French, British, Belgian, and Canadian soldiers. They're all there, okay? French, British, Belgian, Canadian. The Americans aren't in the war yet. So that's probably why they lost that battle. Because if the Americans were there, they would have won big. So where's Dunkirk? Okay, so the British and French troops are being pushed to the north of France, specifically the shores of the North Sea, which is right on the Belgian-French border, and the Strait of Dover... That is the distance. That is where um, England and France is just 21 miles from each other across the English Channel, okay? The Strait of Dover, this is where these, th around that area is where it's, it's happening. I, Dover, Seoul. I love Dover, Seoul. I don't know if it has anything to do with the Strait of Dover, but I do love Dover, Seoul. So Dunkirk in English, Dunkirk, Dunkirk in French, it's a seaside location and it's near the borders of Belgium, France and England. It's right there. So the, the surrounding area, it was, by the way, Dunkirk has always been a site for bloody battles. People get fucked up in Dunkirk, okay? Because it's three countries very close to each other. Anytime there's three different countries, three different groups of men fighting for power, they'll all, and there's, and there's a, a central location where three countries are closest to each other, there's always going to be problems there. It sucks. So we have all these soldiers that are basically trying to escape, and the only way to escape is through this freaking Strait of Dover near Dunkirk. So General John Gort, who's the commander of the uh, BEF, the British Expeditionary Force, he feels the only solution is to evacuate the entire force by sea. They got to get all 338,000 of these guys, all from different countries, out by sea. Now, the British and French are a little, obviously, they're like, wait, we shouldn't evacuate. We should fight. I mean, these literally, literally are the Nazis. So, like, we have to fight them. But they knew it was the only option. You were going to lose your whole army if you didn't leave. British forces, they plan this, uh, they plan the operation in Dover, England, um, in, a, in a naval room called Dynamo, which is a good name for a pet. And the, that's why the, uh, the, the, the evacuation of Dunkirk was known as Operation Dynamo because of the room Dynamo. So Hitler gets a little spooked, actually, because what happens is the Battle of France is still going on. And on May 21st, a battle within a battle occurs. It's called the Battle of Arras, where the British Expeditionary Force fights back and they kind of beat the shit out of the Germans. The battle lasted for four days and they really just they just kicked Germany's face and they gave them a lot of losses. Um, but then Germany did come back as they kind of always did in the late 1930s, early 1940s. They just always came back and won and they did wind up actually winning the battle, but they got a lot of heavy casualties. But because of that, and because of this uh, battle of Aras, Hitler was scared of Britain a little bit. And on May 24th, my mom's birthday, Hitler gave the order to halt the advance of the Germany panzer divisions, the tank divisions, and to just bear down on Dunkirk. Forget about everything else. Just go beat the shit out of Dunkirk. Let's try to get a win. And by the way, the panzer division of the German army, also known as the Wehrmacht, were the probably some of the toughest fighting forces uh, in the German army. They had tanks, armored vehicles. Uh, they were just very good soldiers. But the Allies got lucky that Hitler halted because they would have absolutely gotten smoked had they not it's just the truth okay you know me i'm chris the ally i'm chris the patriot i'm on team ally side 
But the bottom line is, is that Hitler and the Nazis weren't fucking steroids and they weren't fighting fair, okay? They were juicing. They were just these roided out freaks on crack. They were on crystal meth. They were literally on crystal meth fighting. They never slept. When you're on crystal meth, you don't have to sleep. Trust me, I know I'm dealing with it. You never sleep. Sometimes I think my one-year-old daughter's on crystal meth. I'm like, are you a little, pa are you a little Panzer Division Nazi? That's what I'll say to her. I said, Who, where's my little Panzer Tank Nazi? Because she doesn't sleep. So Hitler gave the go-ahead for the tanks to go in and steamroll the, everybody on May 26th. But by, by that time, the Allies had gained crucial time and you know they, they, they gained a lot of time. So they got their preparations in place and they were ready. Operation Dynamo begins. Remember, these 338,000 troops need to escape the advancing German Nazi army in France and get across the English Channel into England where it's safe. But right now, we're, we're at a time where they're just sitting on the beach waiting. They're waiting for this rescue attempt and they're just kind of like sitting ducks. They're sitting British, French, Canadian, Belgian ducks. So it was very vital for them, for the allied forces to be able to get all these troops out because if they sat and fought, they were gonna all get killed. Probably all, literally probably all of them would be killed or all of them taken prisoner. And then that's a huge percentage of the allied fighting force that's gone. And then what is Germany gonna do after that? After they, now they've killed and wiped out 338,000 soldiers, you're just gonna go across the English Channel and take England. And then Germany would have taken England too. And then all our tea would have had crystal meth in it. So on the evening of May 26th, the British, they start to begin the evacuation from Dunkirk and they use that code, Operation Dynamo. Now, let me tell you something. I would have, if I was there, right, I would have fought, I would have done anything, including sucking cock to get to the front of the line and get on one of those first boats to get the hell out of there, okay? I Listen, I want to fight for my country, but I ain't trying to die, motherfucker. You need to get my ass out of here, out of France. Y'all didn't tell me this is what France was going to be like. Fucking crazy. Get my ass back to England. Sorry, that was a clip from Flagrant 2. Um, <laughs> all right, so listen, they couldn't just scoop up the soldiers with a big ass boat. There's very shallow waters. You can't just get like a cruise ship in there. So what they had to improvise. So they got all basically the British boys on the other side. They got all a bunch of different kinds of boats. Some were like private, you know, like fishing boats, some were like, you know, uh, 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 adventure boats. We're talking all different shapes and sizes, but most of them small fishing boats to some larger na uh, naval vessels. And they got about 800 to 1,200 boats that helped out our allied Canadians, Belgians, Irish, British, everybody but the Americans. They weren't in the war yet. What's going on though, as the boats were helping out? Well, the German dirty air force, the Luftwaffe, the little rat cracked out pieces of shit, were relentless in bombing the harbor. They were just dropping bombs on these boats that couldn't really defend themselves. I mean, you know, yeah, maybe I have a pistol. What am I going to do? Throw a, throw a fishing hook at a German war, war plane? No, no. So I, they had to slow the evacuation process out because these fucking Nazis were shooting everybody. So the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, were ruthless mofos because they were on crystal meth. Like I said, they're on crystal meth. It was called pervitin, a drug called pervitin. It was a form of methamphetamine. Methamphetamine and crystal meth, essentially what it is today, it was created by the Nazis during World War II. And it was the drug, it was a used to increase alertness, reduce fatigue, and enhance performance among soldiers and pilots. It was like the original Adderall, okay? So all you Adderall college kids, you're taking pervitin, you fucking Nazis. They used pervitin a lot. Um, particularly mostly during the early part of the war um, when German pilots had to go on these long, grueling missions. They supposedly, the pilots supposedly, did not know it was dangerous. The German scientists didn't flag any dangers with it. They thought, yeah, you just piss it out. And it was just seen as a way to help pilots stay alert and focus for extended periods of time. And, you know, um, and they were, when they were experiencing fatigue or whatever, they would just give them more pervitin. And they didn't understand that this was going to have really, really, really bad effects. I mean, a lot of Nazis came back home after the war and they were full drug addicts, full drug addicts, you know, just f going through withdrawals. It was not good. I mean, Hitler's many videos of Hitler. He's just fully cracked out, shaking those famous videos of him. He's, he's on, he's on that pervitin baby. Now, you guys are saying to yourself, will you potentially go to patreon.com slash Christy Comedy and on the Chris, bring back the Chris and Eddie show and do Pervitin? And the answer is yes, I will. Go sign up. The use of Pervitin kind of really shows what dirtbags the Nazis were and what length they would go to to try to just be ruthless because what Pervitin, another side effect of it, 
is it kind of shuts off your empathy buttons. You're not, you could kill people, you can push people into gas chambers, you can do all these horrific things because you're on this drug. And then when it came out of your system, months and months later, you realized you were horrible. And a lot of German soldiers commit suicide, they commit sui wooey after realizing what they have done from that pervitin. No. <laughs> now, what I just said has not been proven, but again, here at the Chris Reed Stefano Show, we take a stance, and that's the stance I took. German soldiers commit sui, sui wooey two to three months after the war because Pervitin got out of their system, and they realized that they were being very bad boys. All right, quick sum up of Operation Dynamo and how we got our boys out of France. They used civilian and naval vessels to transport our boys. Um, along with the civilian boats, they had the, the naval vessels, they had um, destroyers, they had other warships that were used to transport from Dunkirk to Britain. They did it at nighttime. It's very difficult to see anything in the night. As, you know, they didn't have night vision goggles back then. You know, all they needed to do was call me and I have night vision goggles for them in my basement and a 30-day supply of fettuccine Alfredo. It was nighttime evacuation, so everything they did was mostly at night to avoid detection from the German warplanes, and they used the cover of darkness to help them because dark lives matter. They also used smoke screens, okay? They used smoke screens to obscure the boats from the view and to protect from enemy fire. They just put up those smoke screens, baby, just kind of like how my girl does. She puts up a smoke screen, and she's telling me one thing, but she's really doing another. And they had air support. Last but not least, this is where Tom Hardy comes in. They had air support by the British Royal Air Force, and they provided the air cover for the evacuation. They engaged in dogfights with the cracked out German Luftwaffe, and they protected the boats and the soldiers on the beaches. So thank you to Tom Hardy and the British Royal Air Force for saving our boys. So now it's May 27th on the first full day of this evacuation, Dunkirk evacuation, aka Operation Dynamo. We had 7,500 biological men get out of Dunkirk. Day two, around 10,000 biological men got out. So that's great. They're going from Dunkirk to France. They're going from Dunkirk, France to Dover, England, aka Dover, Seoul, England. And we're getting them to safety. 45,000 men got rescued um, from the British command alone. But by June 4th, 338,000 soldiers, including 120,000 French, had been evacuated. We did it. We got all these different guys out there and we were waiting with open arms in Dover, England and prostitutes for the French and it was beautiful and glorious. Unfortunately, thousands of French troops did get left behind and they were taken prisoner by the advancing Germans. So a lot of these French troops, they just had to get their dicks wet one last time and unfortunately, you got captured by the Germans and God knows whatever happened to them. Now, there is a cool little story. There was 99 British soldiers that escaped to a village 55 miles from Dun Dunkirk to a farmhouse in the village of Paradis. It's paradise without the E. And they were met up by German soldiers who ignored a surrender and were shot to death on sight. Most were marched to an open field where they were stripped of everything from gas masks to cigarettes. You never want to take a cigarette away from a French soldier. That is not nice. And then they were led to a pit and shot, and the Brits who survived the machine gun fire were either stabbed to death with bayonets or shot dead with pistols. It sound, that was it's very Japanese of them to do that. That was not nice. That, that sounded like the rape of Nan King. Not good. Two soldiers played dead, though, and actually lived to tell the story. That's what you got to do in these situations, kids. Play dead, okay? Play dead. If you don't, playing dead, it can be used to get out of a near-death situation. Or, you know, there's a lot of times where I don't want to have sex at night, and I just play dead. I play dead in the bed, but I'm really wide and awake, but I don't want to go through... I don't want to have, have sex and then, you know, have it take you three hours to try to make you come. I just want to go to sleep and have dreams about Tom Hardy. So after Dunkirk, the BEF, the British Expeditionary Force, they lost about 68,000 soldiers. Um, during the campaign, they had to leave nearly all of their tanks and vehicles and equipment behind. Thousands of French troops got taken prisoner. Six British, three French destroyers, 200 small uh, uh, craft were sunk by German mines, torpedo boats, U-boats, aircrafts. The Germans just, just sinking everything. Both sides lost over 100 aircraft total. So this was pretty bad. I mean, this was inflicted some damage on both sides. But overall, the Battle of Dunkirk, it was an important turning point in the war, and it marked a significant moment in the history of World War II. The success of the evacuation was a big turning point because guess what? A lot of highly trained soldiers uh, were rescued from the BEF. This ensured Britain could fight back and later win the war. Shout out to the United States for helping. And it boosted morale for the Allied forces and helped to galvanize the determination to continue fighting against the 
Dirty, ugly, cracked out Axis powers. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill called the outcome a miracle in his uh, speech, We Shall Fight on the Beaches, which was on June 4th uh, at the House of Commons. You've heard that. You've heard that speech a million times, We Shall Fight on the Beaches, inspired by Dunkirk. Um, so it was a beautiful, beautiful, uh, turned out to be good news for, for the Allies. And um, it was 10 days, did 10 days trying to survive these Nazis and escape these crystal meth crackheads. Even though it wasn't a win per se, uh, for the Allied forces, not losing men was huge. Um, could you imagine losing that many men in one year? I mean, it, it'd be like COVID in democratic states. It's it's a lot of men. <laughs> this was just a very crucial moment during World War II, and it was a true testament of how Allied forces could work together to fight the Nazis. If you work together, kids, you can beat anybody. And remember one thing, if you're going to remember one thing at all. First thing is... Ponzer Chocolat, a.k.a. Pervitin, a.k.a. Crystal Meth, is not good for you, and you should not take it unless you are fighting in a war invading Poland. And the second thing to always remember, yesterday was history.